such a blessing to be with you guys tonight. Um, and I was glad that you asked. I was going to do that to see how many of you are familiar with Far Reaching Ministries. So I'll give you an opportunity tonight to share a little bit about who we are, about what we do, um, why I think you're going to care. Um, I also want to bring a, an exhortation from the text. And um, yeah, I was, I'm just so blessed to be here with Chris. And like you said, we connected years ago. And you, know, you meet different people. Um, and there's people that, you know, you don't see for years. And as soon as you see them, you're like, it's like you talked to them last week. And that's what it was like with Chris. I was just like, hey. And we have a lot of shared similar experiences, shared passion, obviously a love for the Lord, a love for his people. Um, and so I'm actually, we're having dinner tonight afterwards and trying to get Chris to come out to Africa with us and some of our outreaches and partnering in, in greater ways. We always are looking, I was some looking for great teachers. Um, and I'll share with you what we do at Far Reaching to come teach our chaplains. And I also like to travel with people that I like. And so Chris is one of those people. So great teacher, as well as somebody that I wouldn't mind hanging out with for a couple of weeks um, on the mission field. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 tonight. And really, tonight won't be, um, it, it definitely will be an exhortation from the text. But really, uh, I want to update you stories from the field of what God is doing and, and what God is doing in the world and through far-reaching ministries uh, there's a few things I, I do want to end with about Afghanistan and Ukraine, some operations that we have been involved with and ongoing uh, towards the end of the message. And so uh, pick up with me, Philippians chapter 2, and a very familiar passage of Scripture. Um, we'll read through that. We'll pray. We'll get into the message tonight. I'm reading just so you know as you follow along with me from the English Standard Version, the ESV. That's what I brought with me this weekend. Paul writes, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Father, I thank you so much, Lord. It is so good to be in your house. I thank you for those that you've gathered here this Saturday evening at Calvary Chapel Surfside here in Florida. Father, I just pray, Lord, you would speak, that we would have ears to hear, that every single one of us would leave here different. We would leave here challenged and changed. And Lord, we just pray that you would be glorified and honored with everything that is said and done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As I mentioned, it's such an honor to be here. And I want to just start off right away saying my purpose, why I am here and why I get on a plane to travel all over the world as a ministry, as well as all over the country and get to speak to believers such as yourselves. My prayer and the desire on one hand will be to bring a message of comfort. Because I realize for some of you, you are in a, the valley of your life. For some of you, you are in the valley of the shadow that David talks about. We are constantly bombarded with bad news. The, the, the world around us, whether it's Afghanistan, whether it's Ukraine, whether it's the stock market, whether it's inflation, whether it's your own personal thing, there are things that come upon us. And I know for some of you right now, it's not just global. It's not just out there. It's personal. You're hanging on. And you're thinking, how am I going to get through next week? How am I going to get through next month? And if you're not there, maybe you know somebody who is, and, and maybe you're going to be able to encourage them or You've already been out on the other side of that. I want to say with every fiber of my being, the God that we serve is the God of the mountains. He's also the God of the valleys. And Romans 8, 28 is always true. God has a plan. He has a purpose. And he truly does work all things out for good. And if you hang on and trust him, he will work things out for good in your life. I know he's done it in mine. 
And I can say that because he's doing it in the thousands of lives that we connect with as a ministry every single day. There are people's lives that we minister to in South Sudan and Uganda and Burma, uh, places like Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, the places that God has called us to. I want to tell you, their situation is not good. The things that they deal with are, are far from good. They are downright wicked and evil, and yet God has a way of working it out for good. And I want to share some of those stories tonight to encourage you that the God of, the, the, the person in Iraq who's, who's experiencing miracles, he's the God who wants to work in your life. So I want to encourage and comfort some of you. And for some of you, I want to challenge and, and, and exhort you. I know for me in my own life, I need that at times. <laughs> In fact, some of the things I'm most thankful for in my life are the times when either a person that God used or a message that God used just kicked me in the butt. You know, just like woke me, shook me, kind of aroused me. And, and I pray for some of you, that's what would take place tonight to, to evaluate, to listen, to hear the voice of the Spirit, what God's calling you to do personally in your community, in this church, and in, 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 in your life. And so that's my prayer and desire. You see, the thing I do know is that God does have a good plan. Jesus came and he purchased something for us. And the Bible gives us some different descriptions for that. He came to give us life and life e eternal. But eternal life, the Bible says, isn't just simply a quantity of life. Eternal life doesn't just simply begin when we leave this world and then we get to heaven, that's eternal life. No, eternal life is a quality of life. Eternal life, Jesus says, is to know, to know, to know him and to know the Father. It's a quality of life. The, the, another description, Jesus says, I came to give you life and life more what, church? abundant. He says, I, I have a life for you that's not just eking by. It's not just scratching by. It's not just struggling every day like the world struggles. But no, he says, I came to give you life and life abundantly, overflowing joy. That's the life. That's, that's the Romans 8, 28 that God has for you and purposed and destined and desires for you to experience. It doesn't mean that life's going to be perfect and, and easy, but oh, what he promises is abundant life. And sadly, so few Christians I see experience the abundant life on an ongoing basis. They, they, they taste it here and there. And the reason why I'm convinced is because so many Christians, particularly in America, think the American dream is the abundant life. And they think, if I have the American dream, you know, I've got a house, I've got a car, I've got a 401k, and it's, and it's not half of what it was last year, like a lot of ours is right now, or whatever it might be, then, then things are good and I have the abundant life. Let me tell you, church, that is not the abundant life. Now, the father that we, that we serve and love, he's a good father. He loves to give good things. And there's nothing wrong with having good things. In fact, the text tells us it's okay to think of yourselves, but it says don't only think of yourselves, think of others. You see, the reason I can say this, that there's abundant life, is because I get to meet people, whether it's down in Mexico, whether it's down in Latin America, some places that we minister to. Listen, they have nothing that remotely looks like the American dream. There's no social security, there's no health care, there's no nothing, and yet they have a quality of life that I'm envious of. Stories of women who have been rescued out of the cartel, whose lives have been threatened by their husbands, who bear the scars sometimes on their necks of the knife wounds. And I think, how, do you, how are you even living, and yet you're not just living, but you're, you're singing and your hands are outstretched and you're serving. You don't have what I have. You don't have the things that I get to experience in America. And yet you have a life. You have a joy. You have a connection with the Lord. And, and church, that's what God has for us. The thing about this, uh, uh, res, uh, uh, this abundant life, one of the other terms that the Bible describes to us is also called the resurrected life. And just, that, just by that term, and we'll see in our text tonight, the resurrected life means there has to be a death. And that's the thing that we so fight against. No, I don't want to go. I don't want that. And, and it's the very thing that the Lord is saying, would you trust me? Whatever this thing you might be going through, it might feel like you're dying. But on the other side of that thing, if you're trusting and holding on to the Lord, there's life. And so tonight we're going to see really the path to glory, the path to life, the path to abundant life. And we'll see it there in the life of our Lord. And we're going to kind of land there in the middle of the message. But the first part I want to share is just a little bit of background of who Far Reaching Ministries is, and who we are and what we do, and why we do what we do, why we do what we do. Our ministry began almost 30 years ago, and it began really accidentally, at least from a human standpoint. Our, our founder, Wes Bentley, a, a, a man who got radically saved, a, a man who, by his own admission, tells a story, a violent man who lied to get into the Vietnam War at 17 because he wanted to go fight and kill people. That's who he was, and yet God radically got a hold of his life. 
And after he got out of the Marines, he wanted to serve the Lord and he was serving God all over the world. And particularly he felt called to Russia and he was going into the prisons and particularly the youth. This was after the fall of the Iron Curtain. But because of his skills as a former military man, a different, different missions organization was wanting to pioneer work in South Sudan. And if you know anything about the country of Sudan, it's a very strategic place, but it was a country that had experienced decades long of civil war, primarily in the North, funded by oil money out of Egypt and Arab, Arab countries, Muslim dominated and controlled ideologically, pursuing, punishing, persecuting, and annihilating most of the Christians and the tribal people of the South. Millions killed. And so this ongoing civil war, and, and, and they wanted to pioneer this missions organization to work. And so Wes, ministering in Russia, felt called to Russia, said, yes, he'll go in for a couple of weeks. And in that couple of weeks, God began to do some things that he wasn't expecting. Doors began to open. Proverbs 18, 16 says, a man's gifts will make room for you. The gifts that God has given you will open up doors. And that's exactly what happened. Because as a former military person, though he was looking, you know, just simply as a safe place and reconnaissance where the missions operation could set up to distribute Bibles and medical care, all of a sudden he was introduced to a, a soldier. And then one soldier after another. And eventually he's standing before one of the, the, the top generals in the South Sudanese army. This was a man who had experienced extreme, extreme pain. In the, in, the, in the freedom, you know, in the fight for freedom for his own country, sadly, his own village, his own wife, his own children were butchered by the, the Muslims from the north. And, and, and in that rage and hurt and pain and anger, leading his men on, on a noble and just cause, he also knew by himself, like a lot of times in war, he went way too far. And he was known as a butcher. He was a great soldier, but also a violent man that even his own men feared it out of his own pain and hurt. And he was struggling with living with himself. He couldn't sleep the nightmares. And Wes began to share with him, and he began to share about his own story, his own past, his own testimony. He shared about the Apostle Paul, who once was a persecutor of Jesus, and how God radically got a hold of him, changed and saved his life. And this general, with all the guilt and the shame that he carried, wondered, could he be saved? And Wes shared the gospel with him. He said, yes, you can be saved. And he led him in the sinner's prayer, and something happened in that general's life. For the first time, he, not only was he born again, but he was delivered. He experienced freedom, freedom from the demons and things that had just plagued him and, and the violence that had just racked his soul. And he slept and he was free for the first time. And he said to Wes, my men that I serve with, they need what you have. Will you come back and teach my men? And he prayed about it. And, and though he had no desire to go to this place, he felt like, no, this is the voice of the Lord. As a former soldier, he knew that the, the highest command that a soldier has is to obey the orders of a senior commander. And he knew God was commanding him to go. And so for Wes, you know, he felt called to Russia where a hot day in Russia was like 70 degrees, where a cold day in South Sudan is like 95. But he said, yes, Lord. And what began was with a simple yes, and, and what Wes always tells us is this, is obedience is the safety net of the believer. And in your life, the safest place to be, and we go into some very dangerous, violent, extreme places as a ministry, but we know when we say yes, obedience is always the safest place to be. And Wes said yes to the Lord. And what began with just a few people, over 600 chaplains have been trained over the last almost 30 years. And these chaplains are not like uh, our chaplains in the military, who I love and respect our men and women who serve as chaplains. They provide spiritual care. The men that we train in South Sudan not only provide spiritual care, but they also have to fight. Just because of the nature of where they live and the, and the scarce resources, resources being men, they have to not only know the word of God, they also have to know how to work with an AK. So if you ever read the book of Nehemiah, it says when they were building the wall, they had a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other. Well, our, our chaplains literally have a Bible in one hand and, and a Kalashnikov or an AK in the other. And what I love about these, and this is why I'm talking to Pastor Chris, is we bring different guys out, different pastors to come and, and to teach these men, teach them the word of God from Genesis to Revelation. But not only do we teach them the word of God, we also because they are dealing with, like I mentioned, some of the most horrible atrocities you can imagine. Women who have watched their husbands butchered, women who have been violently raped, not once or twice, women who have been left without children, children who have been left without parents and experienced some things that we can't even begin to imagine. Our chaplains who are really essentially pastors who love the Lord know they have to be able to minister to these people. And it's not just enough to pray and say a prayer and, and move on, but to, how do we heal 
the trauma that they've been through? How do we show up and, and let them know that God sees and cares and bring healing to their life? So our chaplains not only get trained in the word of God, they also go through women's ministry and they also go through children's ministry. And, and these men are my heroes in the faith. It's one of the greatest privileges every time I get to go and, and hang out with them and to teach them and to worship with them and to pray with them. These are guys like Lino who have literally physical scars on their face, battle wounds, shrapnel wounds, and they don't ever really want to talk about it. And, and these are guys like big, strong Dinka men, huge. And, and if, if they were given the command, they'd backhand, you know, they would do whatever it needed to take to go defend and fight for a village. But these same guys, I, I went and did village outreaches with the kids and I, with Lino, I was playing Red Rover, Red Rover. You know, these are the kind of guys that I think of David's mighty men who knew how to fight to protect the innocent. They knew that it may cost them their life. They didn't have a death wish. Our, our chaplains don't have a death wish. They want to live, but they know it may cost their life. And 73 of our chaplains have laid down their life in preaching the gospel. They've paid the ultimate price. In, in the places that they've gone, bringing the Jesus film, planting churches, fighting and protecting and standing there for the innocent. I think of guys like one of my heroes, a man named Paul Quo, is a six foot five dink. It was a guy I met on my first trip to, to South Sudan and training the chaplains. And I remember on day three, uh, we have been praying and hanging out and Paul was just taking copious notes. He was huge, just blackest skin you'd ever seen in your life and the whitest teeth you'd ever seen and just smiling full of joy. And I remember I went and put my hand on his back and it was on fire. Like Paul's on fire. When I say it was on fire, I'm not talking spiritually. I mean, that guy's on fire. No, like literally, I've never felt anybody with a fever like that in my life. I was like, Paul, are you okay? Or, no, I'm fine. He wouldn't tell me. He wouldn't tell me. Finally, one of, the, one of the other chaplains, after Paul got up and left, he said, he doesn't want to say anything. But every morning he gets up at 6 a.m. and he goes to the clinic before he comes to the services because he has typhoid and malaria at the same time. And Paul had walked two weeks off the front line. And, and when we gather our guys every year for a refresher course, we bring them off the front lines. And we, we, for two weeks, we feed them because most of the time they're subsisting on beans and rice and something called posho, which is this kind of corn maze. Looks like mashed potatoes, but tastes like nothing and just sticks everywhere, you know? And so Wes is always great. He kills all the cows we can possibly to feed them and to take care of them. And most of them are hooked up to IVs for a few days and just dealing with all this stuff. And Paul never complained. And I remember in that moment thinking a few things. Number one, I thought, man, I am such a wuss. <laughs> the things that I complain about. And Paul was so happy to be with his brothers, worshiping the Lord, learning the word of God. I just found out a few months ago, Paul went to be with Jesus. He was a man about my age, actually. But his liver eventually gave out all the things that he was dealing with. And, and Wes was with them as he was saying his final goodbyes. And, and his final words were, you know, he didn't feel sorry for himself. He wasn't angry, bitter. He, he was so excited to see Jesus. And he simply said, Wes, tell the other men it's worth it. Tell the other men to keep going. I'm going to see Jesus soon and I'll meet them there and I can't wait. But tell the men to keep going. It's worth it. And eventually his body gave out. And, but it was a life that he was, he was glad to, 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 to live. It says like in the book of Revelation, they loved their life. Uh, they did not love their life even unto death. And that's the men. And the chaplains really have come to define who we are as a ministry. They are constantly running into places that others are running out of. And that really defines who we are. And what it makes us unique is that we do operate very uniquely training chaplains in a war-torn country. And what started there, God has expanded because obedience is not only the safety net, but obedience brings blessing. And what started training chaplains has expanded to now 37 different countries that God has called us to and most of the countries that we are working in are some of the most dangerous countries in the world. Nine of the top 10, according to our State Department, I mentioned a few of them, Syria, Iraq, Burma. We even got to work now. We have one guy pioneering to work in North Korea. We have a whole division of our ministry called Ghost Operations. And, and essentially, again, if you're a military person, Ghost Operations is what, why we label this. It's the invisible hand of the church, of you and, you and I, into the persecuted world. And some of them are, are Western missionaries, but primarily most of them are, are indigenous native people who are out there planting churches, the underground church that we get to stand with and support. In fact, I was just in Turkey a couple of weeks ago. Turkey uh, is kind of like a middle, you know, kind of a Switzerland of the Middle East. And so we were able to bring some of our frontline workers out of Iran and Pakistan in Turkey, Ukraine and Russia to equip, to encourage, to just love on them and to get some updates in their stories. And these guys, again, are my heroes. 
the things that they've experienced, the things that they've been through. One of the wives from the pastor in Iran, they, she told the story through tears and of being, having their door kicked in in the middle of the night and having a, an automatic weapon right in her face with men screaming at them, being taken from their homes, taken to Evan prison and, and interrogated for weeks on end. She described how they turned the heater up as loud as it could be in the, in the room, and they bright lights, loud music, all the things that you've seen on TV they experienced, and they kept saying, deny Jesus, deny Jesus. Tell us who your brothers and sisters are. You know, tell us who these other Christians are. They didn't use the term brothers and sisters, but tell us who the other Christians are, and they wouldn't do it, wouldn't do it. You're never going to see your kid again. They threatened her with rape and all kinds of things. And as she told the story, it was traumatic. She told the story shaking through tears. Like it was, it's not that this didn't affect her. It affected her deeply. And yet there was not one semblance of bitterness or anger or, or how could you God? There was, she was so full of faith and she believed in the sovereignty of God in a way that I, I, it challenged me. She said this and I could not, I could not imagine it. She said, we asked her, we were interviewing like, what about your child? Did you believe that they were going to take your child, your son? And she's like, I believed it. Well, what did that make you think? She says, I don't know, but I knew that God loved me. He loves my son. And somehow he would protect him. Somehow that even my son would be used to continue on the revival. There's a revival happening in Iran. God would use my son to preach and save that Muslim family. Lord, That's the kind of faith that she had. And though it was traumatic, they weren't turning back. Though it was trauma that they had experienced, they were so full of faith and hope and love because of what God had done in their life. One of the things that I get privilege, and I'm privileged to do it, is our ministry. Is my, my title is Director of Victims of War. And it's just that in all these countries, there's, there's innocent victims. Women, and particularly women and children who don't want to fight, who have n- no say in it oftentimes, and yet they sadly are the ones who experience the most pain, the most hurt, the most trauma. And so we have, we have orphanages and schools and different things all over the globe. And this is really personal to me. And one of the reasons why I was in pastoral ministry when Wes asked me to join the team full time, I was, as as Chris mentioned, I was a missionary in France for several years. I was an executive pastor, a very large Calvary chapel in in Southern California. But when I got the opportunity to do this, I knew like, yes, Lord, this is what I want to do. My youngest son, we actually adopted from Uganda. He's 19 now. He was two when he came into our home. And, And so this is personal to me. And Isaac is 19. He graduated last June. And, and I always loved going to Isaac's football games in, in high school. And I always felt sorry for whoever tried to tackle Isaac. He's got muscles on muscles. I, I always like to look at him and say, yeah, you got this from your dad, but obviously not me. You know, I'm like, just, want, just blessed genetically. But more than that, Isaac loves Jesus. And he is an amazing anointed worship leader. In fact, I was hoping to bring him on my trip to have him come lead worship. He's just a, an ex- who, you know, there's like the psalmist anointing on them. So this is personal to me. One of the things that I'm blessed because I live in San Diego, we have a work down in Ensenada and the surrounding areas. And I remember about a year ago, one particular young boy, there's a lot of young kids and moms and grandmothers that have been rescued out of the cartel that we work with. We build homes for them. We help feed, we help schooling. We do a lot of different things. But this one particular boy, Luis, he's, he's stuck with me. And, and when I met Luis, I didn't know his full story, but when I first met him, he wasn't talking. And I asked Bigtha, who oversees a lot of our work down there, can you tell me his story? Because we were meeting with the kids. And Luis had a couple, he had younger sisters, and we were working with his grandmother, and I didn't know what, anything about his mom. And what happened with Luis was his younger sisters and his grandma we've been working with, one night Luis sadly hears his mom talking, talking with her boyfriend about selling him, Luis, to the cartel for drugs. Could you imagine hearing your mom Talk about selling you for drugs at a cartel. And at seven or eight years old, Luis knew what that meant. At best, it meant he would be begging and whatever money he collected, he had to hand over to the cartel. It meant at a certain age, he'd be forced to bring drugs or whatever else. Or at worst, it meant his body would be sold and exploited sexually to be used. And so Luis took off running that very night. And miraculously, we don't know how, but in Ensenada, he took off running from his mother's house and somehow miraculously found his grandmother's house. Now, Ensenada, is, you think, oh, if you've never been, you think, oh, it's a small place. It's humongous. It takes like an hour to drive from one side to the other. How Luis found the home of his grandmother, we do not know. Obviously, the, God's hand and angels were guiding and directing him. But in the trauma, Luis didn't speak for months. And, and one of the local pastors, met, meeting with Luis and his sisters and feeding and schooling, 
But eventually we started working with him and getting him drum lessons and doing some trauma therapy and things like that. And that's what we do. We walk with people, you know. We walk and see that, you know, God has a bigger purpose and call and to bring healing. And we had brought Luis about six months ago, six, seven months ago with a group of about 16 down to the beach. Now, Ensenada is right on the ocean, but a lot of these kids have never been at the beach before. Could you imagine living in Melbourne but never going to the ocean? That's, that's essentially what it was like for these kids. And so we brought him down to the beach and Wes, our founder, just loves, you know, all the things that we do, this is one of the things he just loves. And we just had this big barbecue and all the kids had a birthday. Whether it was their birthday or not, they all got a birthday present. They all had a big birthday cake. We sang happy birthday to all of them. Uh, there was a guy selling, you know, uh, pony rides on the beach and we put all the kids on the horses. They all got rides and they were smiling. They had games, they had hot dogs. It was funny. I, I think I'd never seen kids eat so many hot dogs in my life. I didn't know it was possible. But all of a sudden I heard Luis talking and laughing. And I had to go, Bic, is that the same Luis? And she said, yeah. And she had like tears in her eyes. See, that's what happens on the body of Christ. There's a lot of evil, but the body of Christ willing to do something. The body of Christ there, the body of Christ at large, when we come together, something powerful happens. There's a brand new work in Latin America that we're pioneering, rescuing children from sex trafficking. This is a country that I had been through on vacation. I'd gone down surfing there. I always thought it was a great country, and I had no idea the evil and wickedness that was happening with the cartel. See, the cartel can make their money off of selling drugs and laundering money, but they can also make money off of exploiting not just grown women, which is tragic, but young kids. And sadly, there's a lot of perverted, twisted people that are willing to spend a lot of money to have sex with young girls from six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old and young boys. And so we've started a brand new work down there. And as a, at present, we have 65 children who have been rescued. We have a brand new children's home that we've opened up down there where we have a, an entire team dedicated to loving these kids, to seeing that these kids are healed. And we have to walk with these children. They have to be healed in a lot of ways. There's surgeries, sadly, that have to be done with a lot of these kids just from the, the physical abuse that they have endured. There's emotional healing that they have to walk with. We were down a few months ago, Edward, who directs our ghost operations and myself, and we were doing some training with the team. And we were providing some spiritual care and they had gone through some different training to provide healing specifically for sexual trauma because it's a whole different sort of thing. It affects people a lot deeper. And as we sat then, after I had taught, there was a local SWAT team leader who was training our team on basically security details and, and how to protect these children. We've got a, a secure compound, walls and everything else, but the cartel, and even still, they're, they're, they want, sadly, excuse me, their property back, their money-making scheme back. And so we have to protect these, these kids. And the team has to know how to protect them. So they have to learn how to park and where to park and that, how to answer a phone and not answer a phone. They have to go through details like the SWAT team has to go through. Now, listen, these are, these are mostly women Few, few men, but mostly women make up our team down there. They're, they're not military people. They're not former police officers. They're just people like you who are willing to risk their lives to see that these kids get healed. And I remember talking to our leader, Gabriel, down there. I said, Gabriel, do they understand what they're doing? He's like, oh, yeah. And he said something to me, and I knew the statistic, and sadly, it's gotten worse. Before, it used to be one out of four, but now it's one out of every three. This is in the United States, too. One out of three people in their life will be the victim of some kind of sexual assault trauma. One out of three. I'm just going to look in the room at a size like this, and I know that somebody here, a few of you here, either know somebody that has experienced something, or you've been the victim yourself. And Gabriel said something about that, his team. He said, when they were going through the... the the training for the trauma, he realized 80% of his own team had been the victims themselves. Gabriel, our leader, his own story as a young boy had been victimized sexually, and he knew that, that pain and humiliation. And, and so because of that, they were willing to, to, to risk it all. Have you ever heard of the phrase, hurt people hurt people? Yeah, we know that. People that have been hurt oftentimes repeat it. But church, I want to say something to you. Healed people heal people. And we as the body of Christ, we've, been, we've all been healed. To be forgiven of sins means we've been healed. And to know Jesus means that we are experiencing ongoing healing. And some of you have been healed from drugs. Some of you have been healed from past, who knows what. You've been healed at, or, and God is ongoing. He's healing you. But he does that so that you can be used in bringing healing to other people.
Uh, yeah, I know, I've been in those questions where the pastor gets, no, we, we should all desire to live a life of significance. Why? Because you were created in the image of God. You were created to reflect his glory. You were created on purpose for a purpose. Now, listen, you might have been an accident to your mom and dad. Like maybe your brother and sister, like 12, 13 years older, you know, and they're like, whoops, there's you. You might have been an accident to mom and dad, but you are not an accident to God. You've got a purpose. A few months back, I was in Montana, and this 16-year-old girl came up to me. And she said, I'm one of those accidents. And I was like, what? I got a purpose. God made me on purpose. And I couldn't remember what I said. And she said, remember? I'm like, oh, yeah. Her brother and sister were like 13 years older, and she was so excited that that resonated with her. Listen, if you've got a pulse, you've got a purpose. Philippians chapter two tells us, it shows us how to live a life of purpose. Several years ago as a pastor, I was doing a, uh, a memorial service and, and I have the privilege of doing a lot of them. And this particular one, I was at a gravesite and I had finished my part of the ceremony and I was simply just walking around and the family were saying their final goodbyes to their loved one. And I looked down at the headstones and I was reading some of the, the epitaphs and what they were saying. And, and one in particular, just the Holy Spirit just used it to grip me. And this particular person quoted the, pretty much the final words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy, where Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my race and I kept the faith. And I remember seeing that and I thought, Lord, I want that to be said of me. And the reality is some of you know, you've known Christians who have started well. They maybe went well for a little while, but a lot of people I realized they don't finish well. Paul finished well. He kept the faith. And I say, Lord, I want to finish well. And I remember looking down there and there was a born on date and there was an expiration date. And in between was a dash. And the reality is for every single person in this room, we all of us, all of us have a born on date. Only God knows when our expiration date is. But in between there's a dash. And for some people, those dates might seem, you know, might be far apart. For some, it might be close, but it doesn't matter. It's, it's what do you do with the time that God has given you? That's your dash. And I thought, Lord, I want my dash to count. How do we do that? What we see here is Paul gives his exhortation here in Philippians 2. We know this. And he's telling the church, church full of people, do you have any consolation, any comfort? Yes. Have I ever been touched by Jesus? Yes. And he goes, let this mind be in you. One of the translations says, this mind must be in you. This is your attitude that you must have. He says, it's okay, think of yourselves, but also think of others. And then he goes on to say, who thought of others? Jesus. Let this mind, this is a choice that you must have. Now, here's an interesting thing the commentators tell us. This particular passage of scripture is probably one of the oldest passages of scripture in the New Testament. In fact, the original Greek, it lets us know it was written in the form of a song. It, there's, there's rhyme and rhythm to it. And so the early church would sing this part of the scripture. They didn't have a written Bible like we did. They certainly didn't have iPads with a Bible on it or, or an iPhone. And so a lot of the times at the church, they would sing portions of scripture. And singing, you know, has a way of evangelizing your heart, right? When you're singing a, a worship song and the truth of God, it gets in your mind, but it gets in your heart. It, it forms you, it shapes you. And so what was the early church formed by? What were they shaped by? They were shaped by this. Let this mindset let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. There's a choice. There's an exhortation. Choose this. What's the mindset? Jesus makes a choice. Does he, does he have a choice to hold on to his reputation? No, it says he made himself. He made a, a choice to humble himself. Jesus, the, the, the king of glory, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Why? Because he's God. But he makes a choice, one, to obey the voice of his father enter into this rescue operation. He makes a choice to humble himself. Why? Because he loves you and me. For the joy that was set before him, Hebrew says, he endured the cross and despised the shame. Jesus empties himself. He humbles himself. But notice this. This obedience is to the point of death, but even the death of a cross. But here's the thing. Then it says this. this is, there's this key word that links it together. Then it goes, therefore, therefore what? Because because of this humility, because of this choice that Jesus makes, therefore God highly exalts Jesus. The Father highly exalts his Son that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. It's hard for us to understand this, but somehow after the incarnation, 
after the death, burial, and resurrection, the ascension, Jesus is somehow even higher. That's what it's telling us. The glory that he has after the cross is somehow even higher than the glory he had before. And what you and I are exhorted, let this mind be in you. Jesus led a life of significance. It was a life for others. It was a life willing to obey the voice of his father. It was a, 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 a life that says, I am going to put others first. The son of man did not come to be served, Jesus says, but to serve and give his life as a ransom. On the other side of that death is life. And church, I want to say to you, on the other side of whatever death that, that, that feels like you might be going through, if you hold on to the Lord, the more you say yes to, to the Lord, there is a life. Not only eternally when we get to heaven, but, but even now of freedom, I am convinced the greater the death, the deeper it, there's a springboard to the greater, even a greater life that God has for you. Let this mind. And the paradox is this. We want to be filled. You got to be emptied first. Jesus says, it says here that he emptied himself. Again, it's a, the, the mind, some of the translations say an attitude. What is it? It's an action. I was listening to an audio book this week on the power of habit. And it said the greatest habits, the greatest actions that we have come from what we believe. What do I believe? Do I believe Jesus is my Lord and Savior? Yes. Do I believe this is the path to glory? Yes. And may my actions line up with that. May the habits of my life line up with that. Lord, I want to be filled with all the fullness that you have. Lord, empty me of pride, of self, of control, of comfort, all the things I want to hold on to. Lord, truly, may I not love my life even unto death. I don't have a death wish, but I pray I would live a life of, of real freedom. It's not holding on, but really trusting you. Church, it's a choice. What this text tells us, there's a choice that you have to make. Let this, that word in English, let, look at, the, look at your dictionary, it says, permit to enter. Allow this. There's a choice that you have to partner with the Lord. Any uh, Lord of the Ring nerds, fans out there? Just myself, if you ever watched some movies? I'll, I'll briefly summarize. The story is about a group of people, elves, men, these little halflings called hobbits, and they have to go destroy a ring of power, the evil Lord Sauron. And this young, young hobbit, who kind of represents every man, for some reason, he particularly is tasked with carrying the ring, and he's got to take it to the fires of Mount Doom and destroy it. And at some point on their journey, it's hard, it's arduous, it, it, it's overwhelming. People that they love are dying. It's just filled with evil and wickedness. And Frodo looks up to his friend, the wise wizard Gandalf, and says, I wish this did not have to happen in my lifetime. And when he says that, I remember thinking, like, we've all been there, right? We get that there's bad things that happen. Like, I don't, like, we understand that, but we're always like, why me? Why now? Why can't it be somebody else? And for us, I wish, that, why me? And Gandalf says, so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. Rather, maybe quote the Bible like Esther for such a time as this. Esther didn't want to be in there. There was a death that had to happen. And literally, it physically could have cost her life, but she said yes. And I'm convinced in all of our lives, we'll all have an Esther moment, a time when we have to say yes. Let this mind be in you. The cross that was placed upon Jesus was placed upon him by his enemies. There'll be things in life, wicked people, people that you might even know, love, and trust that hurt and wound, and you have a choice in that moment to say, Lord, I trust you. I want the way of Jesus. But know this, church, the greater the death, the greater the resurrection. The true church has always known this. I want to show a video now. And as I mentioned, I was recently in Turkey meeting with some of our team members. And we get the testimonies of a couple of our workers from Ukraine. And we had a group from Ukraine and Russia, and I'll share a little bit about that. But I want to show you a testimony of two of our workers, Yana and Petro, who are there in Ukraine serving the Lord. And so why don't we see this now? And I do want to warn you, some of the images are a bit tough, and so if you are sensitive, I want to let you make that choice to watch or close your eyes or what, but let's watch that now. When the war started, it was really dangerous in the first few months. Loud explosions have been now heard in Ukraine with the Russian assault 
has begun. At least 21 people have been killed and more than 100 injured in shelling. People were running around trying to escape. Uh, some people trying to hide uh, underground. Ukrainian cities under siege. As Russia is village that refugees on the move. And capital Kiev surrounded by Russian forces. I, I could hear the sounds of uh, rockets and, and it can destroy 10, 10 story building uh, in one time. The UN estimates there have been 1,200 civilian casualties. So you can imagine how many people got suffered just from one attack. stage in the middle of the war as a church, we decided to stay behind. We prayed, uh, should we leave or should we go somewhere or should we stay? And uh, we have heard from the Lord that we need to stay here and we need to take care of the church and to take care of the people around. I trusted you with this nation, with Ukraine. Uh, this is your ministry, this is where I want you to be and I didn't change my plan. I was busy hosting refugees or trying to provide some food and clothing and eventually it came to like 200 or 300 people per Sunday that were coming to, to receive food at the southern part of Kiev um, the train station. They would hear the gospel and then uh, for 5-10 minutes and then they would receive a, a portion of food. In nine months' time, uh, we helped more than 3,000 people uh, with different issues, medical, uh, hygiene, uh, food, uh, clothes, uh, living area, any, any issues. When the war broke out, I had a vision of a globe and there was a so like shape of Ukraine and Ukraine was shining and then there were like light beams going from all sides of the world and those actually things that were coming into Ukraine they were making Ukraine shine and I got an understanding that this is the prayers of the believers who are praying and covering Ukraine with their prayers. Ukraine is very open to, to the Lord. This is the best time for the gospel to be preached in our country. We are here to bring people hope, the hope of Christ, the hope of His glory. And if unbeliever looks at me, I want him to see the hope. So I would encourage American people to be the one who can bring the light and the hope and show that there is something greater than the earthly things, uh, because that's not what we are actually supposed to live for. God is doing some amazing job and He doesn't know how many you are. He is looking what He wants to do and if you are ready to be used, He will use you. Even if you are one, He can use you in, in an amazing way. Folks, one of the ways that you can actively get involved is a lot of the homes in Ukraine have been destroyed and people are really in trouble there. We are taking 25 containers and building homes it has a large room, two beds, a bathroom with a shower and a toilet, and then it has a place to cook. And we're constructing these for $2,000 a piece. Nobody's making any money, it's just the cost of what it costs to build it. And then we take that container out there and we put it on the property where they live and hook it up to the plumbing. So it's a great way to get involved. Another way that you can get involved is with containers for grandmothers is what we call the program. Both for elderly men and women and for mothers of Ukrainian soldiers whose husbands have been killed. And through giving them $75 a month, and we 
do have to raise two or three sponsors to feed these people. It gives them great hope. So we hope that uh, you'll help us to just really care for these people. God bless you. When uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, it broke the hearts of many of us in our ministry because we'll, we, have, we have pastors and workers both in Russia and Ukraine. I mentioned earlier, Wes had a heart for Russia, even though it was Sudan, and, and we've planted and built as a ministry over nine different churches and support many others. We have Potatoes for Grandmothers programs both in Russia and in Ukraine where we help feed a lot of elderly pensioners who would not have enough to eat without the help and assistance of the body of Christ. And so when Russia invaded, we knew it, it was, it was going to cut us off from a lot of our workers, both in, in Russia. We knew the devastation it would bring into Ukraine. But we've also seen in the midst of evil, and really this is right now the front line of so much evil, we've seen God show up. And I do want to say this too. One of the things that I get questioned a lot because people, we get our news from different sources and people want to know well, who's corrupt and, and this side and that side. And we get that question a lot. And I just want to say, our job as believers isn't to say who's corrupt, who's not corrupt. I can tell you they're both corrupt. <laughs> we have some of our, our, our workers, high-end guys, some of our, our team members, current former FBI, working at very high levels with what we're doing. I can tell you there's corruption on both sides. But what I can tell you, there's a lot of innocent people. And our job as believers is to go in and to care and to love and to provide uh, physical assistance, spiritual hope and care. And that's what God has called us to do. And that's what we are doing. Same thing that we're doing in Ukraine. It was, again, another war that we didn't want to be involved in, just like Afghanistan. We had workers in Afghanistan. When Afghanistan fell, we needed to go into rescue operations. And because of our ministry and unique position that God has given to us, we have a lot of friends in the special units uh, and intelligence community. And because of that, over 1,200 people have been rescued out of Afghanistan and resettled and have a new home, a new life. And a lot of them now are getting back into Afghanistan. It's safe and continuing to preach the gospel. We know Putin's... Con what his strategy right now is, he's just trying to somehow, you know, push forward. And what he tried to do this winter was to freeze him out. And if you paid attention, he was strategically targeting all of the, you know, energy plants and electricity producing plants and essentially trying to freeze them out. Now, I showed up in Florida today expecting 75 degree Florida. I don't know what you guys did, but it was like 30 degrees this morning. That's not what I was hoping. That would be, they, people in Ukraine would gladly welcome a 30 degree day today, you know, where the average temperature is in the 15s, you know, the teens every day. And so his strategy was to freeze them out, but they've banded together and they're willing to stick it through. One of our team members came across a few months back, one of an 81 year old lady whose home had been bombed out last spring, actually early on in spring, and she refused to leave. She had been through the Iron Curtain. She'd been through communism. She'd been through it all as a Christian. And she's, I'm not leaving. So her and her husband were, had, you know, huddled up in the back, you know, backyard in this shack and trying to stay warm and their house burned out and we're helping rebuild. And the Ukrainians truly have come together. Three million people, I don't know if you know this, the greatest diaspora since World War II, three million people have fled. Many now are, are returning to come back and, and there's a resolve there. No, this is our country and they're coming together and they're, like Petro said, it's one of the greatest times I've ever seen people open to the gospel. A lot of the pastors that we work with are Calvary Chapel pastors and some others as well, different denominations. God's opened us up a door for us because of our history with the chaplains in South Sudan. We are now at, uh, being able to work with the Ukrainian chaplains and, and we're helping sponsor. And as Wes said, some of those chaplains who have lost their lives, we're helping take care of the, their, their widows and their, their mothers and things. We just did a pastor's conference where some of those chaplains have been serving on the front lines. And a lot of our coordinated effort is going through the local Calvary chapels there in Ukraine, as well as some of the chaplains there, bringing needed medicine like insulin, food, as some of the, you saw in the video, the distribution of these places, helping at early parts of the war, getting people from different parts of the country who are fleeing for their lives as their apartment buildings were being crushed. Now, when we think about this, I hope, I want us to realize that the place that they live in Kiev are places just like the surrounding areas here. These were nice, you know, middle-class areas. This wasn't some, you know, we think of war-torn, impoverished places. These were people driving the same, same cars like you and I were driving, people who had mortgages, people who had their kids in preschool living their life and were invaded. And yet they're, they're pushing through and they're persevering and they're determined to go forward. 
with some of the most amazing stories like we heard from Yana and Petro and, and I got to hear them firsthand and to hug them and to, and to cry and to worship with them and anoint them with oil and to pray blessings on them as they were determined to go back and to continue the work that God had called them to do. As you hear their story, they're so full of faith, knowing what God had called them and knowing what God could do. Some of, our, some of the people that we work with are, are the deacons and they became our transport drivers. And early on in the, in, when the war invaded, they were asking us for a lot of different things and they asked us for weapons and said, no, you know, we can't do that, but what can we do? Can you give us body armor? Yes, we can do that. We are a Christian mission organization. We're not gonna be a weapon supplier, but we can protect those who are going in these places. And because of our connections, we've done just that. One of the stories that just got told me a few weeks back, one of the deacon drivers was out picking up a group of people and he was on his way to go pick up a group of people and he was ambushed by the Russians and they unloaded their automatic weapons in his transport van. They left him for dead. And after 30 minutes, they had left. And miraculously, all the bullets missed him. He did have the body armor, and thankfully, he didn't even have to use that. And he made his way out of the back of the van, and he had to walk 35 kilometers back to the base. And as soon as he got back to the base after the trauma that he had just gone through after 35 kilometers of walking, hoping that some sniper didn't pick him off, the very first words out of his mouth were, give me another van, I've got more work to do. And these are believers who, who love the Lord. Again, they don't have a death wish, but they know what it means that, no, they've got a mission that God has called them to do and they are determined to do it. One of the stories, there was a Calvary Chapel pastor who was, who was a driver and he was picking up some people to bring them to a different area. And so it's happened. Some of the churches have gone from 70 down to seven people because people have left. But in its place, there's new churches that are being popped up and populated all over. And so there's a lot of brand new church plants that are happening all over the country. And so this pastor was driving a group of people and he pulled up to this, this apartment building and this guy comes out tears and screaming frantic, please, please, please take my mom, take my mom. And he reaches into his pocket and he pulls out gold and he tries to bribe the pastor. And he says, here, take the gold, just take my mom, get her to safety and through tears. And the pastor says, no son, we're going to take your mom. We're going to take you. We've got a place for you. You're going to be safe. You're going to be okay. People are more valuable than gold. Put that away. And so they bring this group of people and this pastor drives this group of people to a different church that he had never been to before. And they walk into the facility. They walk into this church and in Ukrainian on the walls, I kid you not, it said, people are more valuable than gold. And they started to weep. The pastor, he had never seen that. It wasn't like he was saying it because he had seen it before. And I share those stories because in the midst of, you see wickedness and brokenness and you're like, Where, where's God? God is there. And NATO is doing its thing and the United States and whatever it's doing. But I want to tell you, church, there's nothing compared. There's no force on earth greater than the body of Christ. When the church of God says, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to band together. And when we distribute food and medicine, when we're planting churches out there, they ask us, who are you? Why are you doing this? And, and we're able to tell people, we're believers, we're Christians, we do this because God loves us and God loves you. Yeah, but where does the funding come? Where does the money, is this, is this from the US? Is it, some, is it from the UN? No, no. These are Christians in America who love you and who have given the money for these medicines, for this food. And they weep and they, they realize they're not forgotten. And they feel, the, the believers there, they, they feel connected to the body of Christ. And I always wonder, and I think about all these places that we get to serve and minister to, what would I want, what would I wish for from the church in America, if I happened to be born in Ukraine or if I happened to be born in Iraq, what would I want then if it was my kids? Would, would they care? Would they give? Would they do something? And so I asked myself that question, you know, and it, it's one of the reasons I feel so privileged to get to share. And, and, and it's tough for me. I have a family and I have kids and, you know, I'd love to be back home in San Diego with them as well. But I, I'm so blessed and privileged and I feel the blessing that God has given me and many other stories to steward to share with the body of Christ, that you would care that you would feel the heartbeat of our Father for them, that you'd be willing to say, I want to do something about it. We don't know what Putin's end game is. We likely could be nuclear. We're praying against that. But I do know this, church, when one suffers, we all suffer. That's what the, the Bible tells us. And the love of Christ compels us. And so my prayer constantly is, Lord, may I see what you see. God, help me to hear what you hear. And Lord, help me to feel what you feel. And there's times, if I can be honest with you, there's times in my heart, you know, the things that we see as a ministry, I don't want to say you get cynical, but it, you're, you're tempted to be. When I get to that place, I'm like, Lord, keep my heart soft. I don't want to get numb to this. I don't want to get callous to this. I don't want to be another thing. And God's good about doing that. And may we all have that same heart. You know, 
you may not be called to run into the places that others are running out of, but you are all called to do something. You might be thinking, well, I can't go to South Sudan. I can't go to Ukraine. And, and right now we're not going into, we're not bringing teams in Ukraine, but eventually when things settle down, we do desire to bring some teams over there. But what can you do? I love what, what Yana said in, in, in the message. She said, what can I do? God just needs one. He doesn't look how many you are, but he looks for faithfulness and obedience. When Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan, did the Good Samaritan save the whole village? No, he saved one. In the power of the Holy Spirit, you can save one. You can reach out to one, whether it's your neighbor, whether it's your coworker, whether it's a family member. You can, you can reach out and love through the power of the Spirit and, and change one person's life. Church, I want to ask you tonight, what's your dash? Where are you making an impact? Where are you making a difference? How can you partner with us? Certainly through prayer. You can pray. You can pray for us. You can pray for our team members. You can pray for the work that we have going on all throughout the world. I know I'm going late, but there's not another service. So anybody want to hear a cool miracle story? Yeah. Okay, good. One of our team workers, um, Ed Gaunt, was worked with Wes from the beginning, was traveling from the capital of South Sudan, Juba, down to our base, Nimali, in the south. And it's a road that we tried not to take. We never took it at night, but for some reason... Ed and one of our senior chaplains, James, had to be on that road at night by themselves. And sure enough, this, this road that was notorious for thugs and thieves, they, they pull up. And, and what Ed said, there was about 20 armed guards. Somehow he knew that they were Muslim men. I'm not sure how he could distinguish that, but he understood that they were. All of them with their automatic weapons, not just at their hips, but at their side, with their trigger fingers ready to go, yelling and screaming. They pull off to the side of the road. Ed doesn't realize what's going on. He, I mean, he, he understands it's precarious, he understands it's life-threatening. He looks to James, and James is normally jovial and says, what's going on? And James looks over to Ed and says, shut up, Ed. At that moment, Ed realized, oh, this is it. And I asked Ed, what did you think? He's like, oh, I'm dying. And, and, and I said, well, how did you feel in that moment? Because we all wonder. I'm like, I, don't, I think I might know how I would respond. He's like, you know, I had peace. I was like, seriously? He's like, yeah, I didn't know how I'd respond. But the presence of God, this supernatural peace was on me. Like, I, I didn't want to die. I mean, as a guy, I wanted to live, but I was ready. And he said, all of a sudden, out of the corner of his eye, this man, as James is trying to talk to his crowd, they're angry, they're demanding something. This, the, the, uh, one of the largest men that Ed says he's ever seen in his life. And Ed himself is one of the biggest men I've ever seen. He said, Ed says, this guy's bigger than him. Ed's about 6'4 and about 300 pounds. He's a big guy. And Ed says, this guy dwarfed him. He gets on the road and he starts with his big finger talking to this crowd of men, of angry men. And it says he looked out and all of a sudden these men who had their weapons like this kind of put them to their side and this confused look came on their face. And James gets back in the truck and Ed says, what's going on? I, like, I don't know, let's go. And he starts the truck and they drive by and the men just kind of move out of the way and let them go. I said, Ed, what happened? He's like, we got about a hundred yards on the other side of these men. And, and Ed's like, I look back. I said, he's like, I want to see who this guy was. And he said, as soon as I look back, he was gone. He said, he was nowhere to be found. And I was like, seriously? He's like, yeah. And I looked and there was nowhere from to hide. There was nowhere. This guy was huge. He was just gone. The next day they went back to try to find out who he was. And they talked to the village around and they described this man. And not one villager had ever heard or seen anybody that looked remotely like the man they were being described to. I said, what was that, Eddie? He's like, oh, I know what it was. It was an angel. And I fully believe that. And so I know the prayers of the saints. 73 of our men have laid down their li uh, lost their lives and laid them down. I think, how many more? That's just the chaplains, let alone some of our ghost operatives. So pray. But I also know this church, that the Bible says, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Me personally, I give you know, part of my salary back to our, to our workers and some of the things. I have missionaries that I support because I believe in them so much. And I know this, the missionaries and the programs I support are the ones I pray about. You know, the ones I care about. I, I have my own, you know, retirement fund as well. And I have some money and some stocks. And you, you know what stocks I care about? <laughs> the ones that I've invested in. Oh man, they stink like all the stocks do this year. You know, where your treasure is there, your heart is also, you're invested. And so there's missionaries that I, I may not financially give, but I pray, but I know that the ones I invest in, I'm invested. And so I've, I'm invested all the way. That's, that's how God's wired our heart. And so what you can also do is you can partner with us financially and there's three things that I, we, I shared about with you today. And, and Wes mentioned that if you would love to partner with us, we love monthly sponsorships for, for some of our programs. One was the frontline children I mentioned of Latin America. These are the, the young boys and girls that 
that are given a second chance, that are, we're going into these places and rescuing them for them. And you can partner with us $75 a month to help feed them. And, and as Wes said, it, it costs more than that, but we, we distribute that out between four or five people, different families to help shoulder the load, to help feed and to take care of them. Wes mentioned potatoes for grandma and the Ukrainian widows, uh, widows of the soldiers and elderly who we help feed and take care of if you'd like to sponsor them again. And then some of the ghost operative pastors that we have. These are some of the workers like Yama and Petro that are in Ukraine. You can help sponsor and take care of, the, take care of them as they are doing the, the work of the front lines. Others in Iraq and Syria and Afghanistan and different places that we help work with. And you'll go afterwards, you'll see me back at the table uh, along with Jonathan and you'll see a form if, if you have more questions, we'd love for you to partner with. But I wanna say a couple of things. Number one, your first privilege and responsibility is to tithe here to Calvary Surfside. And so if you're not tithing here, we would kindly say, you know, hold off on sponsoring us until you support your local church because that's where God calls you to obey and to invest in first and foremost. But if you are and you would like to partner and invest in something, I can tell you is changing lives. I welcome you to partner with what we're doing. To me, it's one of the greatest privileges because I get to see firsthand the lives that are being changed. And so I can tell you, speak of investments, it's one of the greatest areas that you can invest in to truly see people whose lives literally, life and death is in, in the balance. Their lives are being changed, not only physically now, but for all of eternity. And I'd also say this a couple of things. Number one, I can tell you with all the integrity that 100% of what you give to these programs goes to that program. We have, fun, you know, we have donors who believe in us, and, and so they help sponsor and take care of some of our administrative costs so that when I stand before people like yourself, I can say 100% of your gift, if it's to one of these children or to one of the Ukrainians, 100% of that gift goes to that. And lastly, I just say this as well. I don't want to ask you for money. That's not my job. In fact, I don't, I'm not doing that. But what, what I will say unashamedly is you ask God what he'd have you to do. That's the part I have no problem saying. Ask God what he wants you to do. And whatever he says, obey. We know that there's so much going on in the world. And it, sometimes it can feel overwhelming. And our desires, we realize we can't save everybody. But we're going to try to save as many as that God as God gives to us and puts in front of us. Father, I thank you so much for this church. I thank you for this night. I thank you that you have gathered your church here today. And I just pray for Pastor Chris and, and Nada and his family and the elders and the teachers and others here. Lord, continue to bless. Lord, this, this, this church in this area, Lord, there's been history even in this building, but there's a fresh work in this building. There's a fresh work that you are doing here in this area. And so, Father, Lord, I know Calvary Surfside, they're in the trenches, they're in the front lines. That's how we view the local church. And so I pray you would bless and bring many into uh, this community, Lord, that would get saved and get changed and transformed and desire to see others change and transformed. So I thank you for this privilege to be here tonight. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.